Hi, my name's Rich, and today we're going to be talking about the Silver Quill subclass for Strixhaven. It came out in Unearthed Arcana recently for 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons. But before we get started, I want to say thank you to everyone for subscribing. It, the channel is one year old now, and to celebrate, I've issued on Patreon or on the Ko-fi, there should be a link down below, there's a free subclass that I've designed called the Mentor. It's a fighter subclass, and it's perfect for anybody that wants to try and support the rest of their team, a veteran player that is trying to herd new players around, or a new player that wants to take a back seat and let the other players be the main focus of the attention. With the Kofi link, you can make a donation, buy me a magic potion, or you can subscribe on the Patreon. I'm planning to do new subclasses every month, and it's just for the $5 and above Patreon tier. Uh, yeah, so if you'd be willing to help out the channel, it'd be really appreciated. But now, let's get back onto the subclass. First, we're going to look at the lore around Strixhaven and the Silver Quill college specifically, and then afterwards we're going to look over the subclass itself, we're going to analyse all the different abilities and uh, see what we think. Now, let's get started on this lore. In the Magic the Gathering setting there are different planes, and on this plane I think it's Arcavios, the college of Strixhaven was born, which was started out by five dragons, and the dragon for Silverquill is... Uh, Shadrach Silverquill. The whole Silverquill theme in college is uh, wield magic of words, from inspiring battle poetry to biting arcane insults. Stylish, intimidating, and tirelessly competitive. These mages are born leaders with razor sharp wit and natural charisma that can be used for good or for ill. The power is what fuels the internal conflict of Silverquill. The power of words is inherently self biased. So should those with the power use it for themselves, ambition and black manner, or for the good of society, order and white manner? This whole college is a contradiction in the good and the bad, the light and the dark, and it really focuses on discipline and power and how to use the power. It's definitely an order-based college instead of the more chaotic things like Prismari. The white side of Silverquill is about using the power of language to uplift and inspire their allies and shine a light on the evils of society. The black side of it is all about the power of language and the power to point out the stinging truths and attacking their rivals with insults. For the white side you have ink rites, glyph weavers, quillmancers, conjuring energizing verses that manifest as living ink. The inklings are the mascot of this college. And on the dark side, you have banter mages, which sound amazing, <laughs> shade locks, witch slingers, and daunters use their incitive observation to pierce the confidence of their rivals. Ink casters, dusk mages, and shade wigs can conjure inky voids of shadow magic, sometimes crafting them into living flying creatures, the inklings we were talking about, or make weapons of pure darkness. Some of the locations for this college are the Grand Loft Hall, a vast train station-like space with shafts of light streaking in from the enchanted window panes far above. You can see it illustrated in the background here. Grand Loft is filled with balconies, lodges, booths, daisies and other spaces where orators can perform their craft. Inklings flit around the high windowed ceiling and enchanted spotlights automatically focus on any mage who's using powerful magic. The Rose Stage is a rotating circular platform on the Silver Quill campus, with a backdrop of roses made of magical ink. The mage students meet at the Rose Stage to practice performances, spar, or engage in honour duels. Professors and faculty often observe performances at the Rose Stage, watching and coaching the students' magical displays from the sidelines. The Dramarium is a facility where Silverquill students train in physical fitness, dance, martial arts, and other acts of physical performance. With this regard, you could quite easily make a Silverquill monk, a shadow monk, and the theming is fantastic for it. The majors of this college are communications, ethics, foreign languages, journalism, linguistics, literature, law, marketing and advertising, public relations, rhetoric, speech and writing. Some of the famous faculty members are the two deans, Shale and Talon Rook, 
and Emperor's Lou. Uh, in the Magic the Gathering game, this is represented by a two-sided card, and uh, Emperor's Lou is a very strict and serious kind of character, while Shield Talonrook is considered more of a caring mentor-style character. There are two professors, Brina and Nils. While Nils is a human and a great professor, he also has a very strict mean streak. He's constantly disappointed with students' suboptimal choices, and he's mostly known for his doer strictness and hair-triggered scolding. Now Brina, on the other hand, is a powerhouse of charisma. She's always had a talent for getting things her way. If she wants you to do something, you won't just do it. You'll be sure it was your idea all along. Her students and colleagues alike hang on her every word, and in front of a crowd, she enhances her speeches with elegant swirls of ink magic. She's an elite mage who can easily hold her own in a fight, but she prefers to defeat her foes with words alone. Now, the Owling race it can be linked back to the other Unearthed Arcana, which I believe will be in the Strixhaven book, and this is a, an owl-like creature you can choose as a race. Other people of note are Killian Lou, who's the son of Ambrose Lou, and as a student that's been pressured greatly by his legacy to try and live up to his father's expectations. And by all means, he's a fantastic sorcerer, but it feels like he's never living up to his father's expectations. So there's plenty of plot hooks to get involved there. Now, let's have a look at the subclass itself, the abilities, and uh, try and analyze those a little bit. At the start, we should observe that the mages of Solokul can be a bard, a warlock, or a wizard. Now, this works out okay for a warlock and a wizard, but with a bard, they only get three additional subclass benefits, and there are four on this sheet. So, are they going to miss out on one, or will there be an exception for this in the finished book? We won't know until it's released, but I think it's worth noting that it's kind of disappointing because for this it works perfectly with a bard. Everything should be lined up to use it as a bard subclass. With the wizards you do get additional damage and advantages for using cantrips, but I think that's more suited towards the warlock. I'm not sure how the eldritch blast would interact with some of the abilities with the mages of Solar Quill, but uh, it would be a great way to test it out. If you get a chance to play this subclass, Leave a comment down below and tell me all about it. I'd love to hear what you have to say. So, when you first gain access to this subclass, you gain two abilities, Eloquent Apprentice and Silvery Barbs. With the ability Eloquent Apprentice, you learn one cantrip of your choice, either Sacred Flame or Vicious Mockery. Additionally, you gain proficiency in two skills, from Deception, Intimidation, Performance, Persuasion, or Insight. Now a lot of these are charisma based skills, so it works well with the Warlock and the Bard more than the Wizard, but every little bit helps. Also, you gain Silvery Barbs. You can invoke the words laced with magic to demoralize your foes and turn their misfortune into a boon to bolster your allies. This counts as a buff and a debuff, similar to the Bardic Inspiration. Immediately, after a creature you see within 60 feet of you succeeds on an attack roll, an ability check, or a saving throw, you can use your reaction to demoralize the creature. Unless the creature is immune to being charmed, so no constructs or slimes or creatures under 3 intelligence, it rerolls the d20 and must use the lower roll. If the attack roll, ability check, or saving throw then fails, you can choose a different creature you see within 60 feet of you, and that creature is empowered and can reroll one attack, ability check or saving throw within one minute and use the higher result. You can only empower creatures once this way, but but still having a buff and a debuff tied to one ability puts it a little bit higher than Bardic Inspiration. The downside is that you can only use it once every long rest, so this uh, is not an advantage for the Warlock. And you can expend a spell slot to use this ability again. So this kind of favours the wizard in that regard. The warlocks have very limited spell slots, and the bard has enough to play with. Also, limiting it to a long rest really ties down the power of this ability. If you're level 6 or above, you gain access to Inky Shroud. You gain access to the darkness spell. 
and you can use it once without expending a spell slot. And this is tied to a long rest, so no warlock advantages there. But on the upside, you can see through. When you cast this spell in this way, you can see normally through the darkness created. And when a creature you see starts its turn in the darkness, you can deal 2d10 psychic damage to the creature. Now if you have another ability that ties down a creature or reduces their movement speed, then this can work wonders. For example, if you have the Fathomless Warlock in your group, they can use the tendrils to try and tie the creature in place, and then you can throw the Inky Darkness at them. Now, this doesn't scale up with level, but it's still a useful feature to have, and it's a slight variation on a fireball which is focused on just dealing damage. With this you're making creatures blind and dealing a little bit of damage. So it's not the first go-to tool in the wizard's arsenal, but for a warlock you can be interacting with Hunger of Hadar I believe. Oh no, darkness is a concentration spell so I don't think it can interact with Hunger of Hadar. If you're level 10 or above, you can choose the ability Infusion of Eloquence. When you cast a spell that deals damage, you can invoke additional words of power to change the spell's damage to Radiant or Psychic. Any creature dealt damage by this spell takes extra damage equal to your proficiency bonus and has the emotion spayed with Despair or Adoration based on the damage type dealt. If you deal Psychic damage, then the creature is frightened until the start of your next turn. And if you use Radiant damage, the creature is charmed by you until the start of the next turn. Now, there's no save for this. It's an automatic charmed or frightened. So that's quite powerful. And you can use it the number of times equal to your proficiency bonus. And it's tied to a long rest again. So another downside for a Warlock. I don't know if it's going to be modified, but I think tying the... Frightened and Charmed as an automatic when it hits is uh, quite unusual. I've not seen that in a lot of other spells. Now finally, at level 14+, plus, you gain access to Word of Power. Now, with the Bard, you have to choose between Word of Power and Infusion of Eloquence because you only get uh, ability bonuses at level 14, level 6, and level 3. So with Word of Power, you can invoke a Word of Power that is a pinnacle of your magical study. You can choose between Deadly Despair and Selfless Invocation. When you choose Deadly Despair, when the target of your Silvery Barbs fails an attack roll, ability check or saving throw because of a reroll, you can invoke a Word of Despair to give the target vulnerability to one damage type of your choice until the start of your next turn. Now, Combining this with other players, if they want to use lots of fire damage or they have a great psychic damage spell lined up, you can go to town, but you have to collaborate with your players on this. Don't just charge in and then expect everybody to adapt to your situation. The other option is Selfless Invocation. When a creature you can see within 60 feet of you takes damage, you can invoke a word of power using your reaction to grant the creature resistance to that damage and you take an amount of psychic damage equal to the damage the creature takes. Now, if you're a wizard that doesn't have many hit points, this can be a risky gamble, but it favours the Warlock and the Bard because they have a higher hit point pool. And it does use a reaction, but this is a really great way to, say, get down Mr. President and take the extra damage. So, overall, this has a good flexibility option between being offensive, debuffing enemies, and uh, saving your allies. I think the duality mixes well and it goes really well thematically with the idea of the Strixhaven College, because each college has a different theme of uh, contradictions. Now, if you want to continue the conversation, there should be a link to the Discord down below. And if you want to leave a comment or leave me a thumbs up, it'll really help the algorithm. And well, thanks for sticking around. If you're interested in the other colleges of Strixhaven, there should be a playlist down below. I'm going to try and cover all five colleges within the next week or two. And uh, yeah, thanks for sticking around this long in the video. Catch you next time. Bye.